there's been a lot of awesome activity in the Q and A box, but I've tried to pick out maybe four concepts that perhaps we could, you know, have our presenters speak to, um, you know, uh, verbally, just to pull out some of those themes um, from that very active Q and A box. Okay, so um, I'll sort of work backwards. Um, Carl, you you mentioned um, psychological resources. Um, just you know, we had a question about is is that something that people are beginning to address? That question came in right before you addressed it. So um, I feel like over the last decade, that's been a growing uh, discussion in agriculture and emergency management. I think we learned a lot from uh, what we saw happening in Great Britain uh, in, in the last two decades. Uh, would you like to add anything else to that? Well, the only other, the only other thing that I'll add is we had a lot of discussions about dealing with stress, and and a lot of it stemmed around. Uh, we know that this is an issue, and it's a major, major, major issue. And the conversation we had was, how do you frame it? Because if you frame this as something like, all right, we're going to get a bunch of of rugged ranchers together, and we're going to talk about how we feel. <laughs> okay, I see some of you laughing, but, but that's the reality of the scenario. We know it's an issue. What we really need to do is, is determine how do we package that into our programs and into our efforts because it's vital that it's there, but, but it's not the, the headline. All right, thank you. And I'll, I'll just add one thing there, and I wish I had been able to write down the reference. I was uh, actually listening to a radio interview with a researcher from, I believe, UConn yesterday uh, on my way uh, to the western side of the state, but it talked about the fact that most people have two or three people, whether it's a spouse or somebody else that they will confide in, they consider their best friend. But when you survey people and they are asked, who's the last person you talked about, about the most stressful thing in your life, they will name somebody outside of that because they're fearful of judgment or they don't want to be seen as a failure. It's the same reason most people, they said, will spill their guts to a stranger on an airplane but wouldn't think of telling their wife the same thing. And so realize that when we're dealing with agricultural producers, I've seen the same thing in my own work where farmers will share things with farmers from several counties away that they happen to meet at a conference or something that they would never share with their peers that are in their county or within their circle of influence. So it is something that I don't think has ever been studied in the agricultural community, but it does have some interesting insights. There, there's some work going on out of Colorado State that um, they're trying to look at how people recover uh, following one of these disasters. I think it'll be very interesting. They've done it in the past with Katrina and they started working on it with Harvey and they decided to go in and look at the impact on the farmers and ranchers, which they'd really not ever done that before. So it's going to be interesting to see what kind of information they can generate out of those to give us a better idea on what some of this actually looks like a stress level and why people continue to go back to the same areas where disasters occur and continue to try to survive in those environments or what allows them to do that. All right. Thanks. Thanks guys. I want to maybe knock out two more of these uh, subjects before we burn out of time. Um, Kevin um, and Ron, I might pitch this one to you first, but, but Carl, you're welcome to chime in. Um, I'm just going to, someone had a general question about the role of social media in disasters and emergency management. Um, so maybe, Ron, you can speak very recently, like how that might have played a role. And Kevin, I think you have some other comments and just like broad best practices for social media and disaster. Uh, during Harvey, social media was a blessing and a huge curse. Uh, <laughs> because of the uh, ability to get information out quickly it, it helped but some of the information of course you know stays forever even though it's outdated so some way to to manage that and pull that down uh, we were continued to try to get resources rerouted somewhere but somebody would be looking at an old post and trying to send something where it wasn't needed so it wound up being a a 
detriment to some extent from, from our management of the livestock supply points. But I know from some of the actual recovery process, social media was one of the key ways that they actually communicated with one another. And then, there, of course, the Cajun Navy has a whole unique system that they utilize to do that. <laughs> I kind of got uh, involved as well. But <clears throat> from our standpoint, it, it allowed us to communicate sometime in areas where we probably did not have hardwired communications into those um, and was a good access for information. So it, you got to weigh the pros and cons of it. Yep, and I did type a few best practices into the uh, chat box earlier, but I think one of the key things that we've found with some of these incidences is that things get retweeted, they get forwarded. You need to, within the middle of your message, actually put the date that that message was so people know if this is current information or if it's outdated. If you put it at the very end, people lop it off because they think that, well, they won't need to know that. I prefer actually inserting it somewhere in the middle. This make a statement, this is current as of Monday, January 18th or whatever, and then continue on with your statement. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Carl, did you have any thoughts on that? It's you know, I, I think yeah. they covered it pretty well, um, but but at the end of the day, it comes back down to, to how are people communicating, and the reality of our situation is that people are communicating with social media to a large degree, and so, yeah, it, it could be a benefit and a detriment, but at the end of the day, that is one of the multiple avenues that, that information needs to get out in. Okay. Thank you. Um Gosh, two other subjects. I'm torn. I'm going to go ahead and put out um, go ahead. evacuation and shelter because folks seem to be kind of interested in that and had some um, some questions. So um, we have a veterinarian here that works for Extension in Montana, and she's very well versed on evacuation and setting up shelters both for companion animals and livestock and um, what can happen in these mass natural disasters uh, that are, you know, across urban areas, suburban, rural, ag, et cetera. Um, obviously, I think there's something like, um, well, pe obviously people are going to want to take their pets with them and there's two and a half or three pets per household per capita or, you know, in the United States. So um, since Katrina and uh, what is called the, the Pets Act, um, humans should be able to evacuate or co-evacuate with their pet, but not necessarily be co-sheltered. So um, at any rate, things are put in place to uh, try and facilitate that. And um, on the pet side of thing, companion animals, folks aren't necessarily sheltered with their pets. Um, the livestock side, it can be quite complicated and we have so many different systems across the country. In Montana, uh, we might just start driving cattle across the, the landscape. Um, in other parts of our state or other parts of the country, it might be livestock trailer-based um, evacuation uh, from livestock facilities. Um, I will mention that the importance of planning at the community level um, can relate to this because there have been wildfires and other natural disasters where people want to self-deploy to help, and they're clogging up the roads with small horse trailers and small cattle trailers trying to go help somebody, but the human evacuation isn't completed yet and it just causes a traffic snarl or they get to the end and there's nowhere to turn around or back a trailer properly. So this will also speak to comments that came up in the chat about the value of proactive planning and I'll say at the community level. Um, any other comments on uh, evacuation and sheltering pitfalls or sage wisdom? Well, uh, you know, the Harvey response was to not evacuate Houston, which a lot of people questioned, but in the previous flooding, they actually had more deaths occur because of the people that were stranded on the roadways in their cars and were drowned in their cars. And so the decision was made to shelter in place rather than try to evacuate that many people. And I think it kind of goes to some of the same things we run into with with animals, uh, you have to make a decision whether or not you're going to evacuate the person or livestock or both. And unfortunately, some of them get left behind, which you'd hope there'd be a better plan than that. But uh, it, it is a 
tough decision on when to try to evacuate and where to move them and where are you going to find access to grazing land because even in your situation where you move livestock across the landscape, you're then destroying somebody else's grazing or taking it up. Um, so it, it's not an easy decision on whether to evacuate or even where to take animals. Um, and related once again to livestock, um, a lot of people, communities might assume that the fairgrounds is the ideal shelter area or at least the starting point. Um, there may or may not be provisions in place to deal with it at the fairgrounds. And in some cases, and I apologize for continually speaking to the wildfire scenario, um, uh, Forest Service and other emergency response agencies may have wanted the fairgrounds for their own uh, operation center. And so it, it can be crowded with hotshot teams and fire teams and helipads and whatnot and not necessarily ideal for bringing in livestock. Um, so this is once again why um, community level planning is so important. And I'll maybe start to wrap up with mentioning that a lot of our large operations, um, you know, need to have robust internal response plans, but then they also have to cooperate with that community and uh, understand where an operation like that might have resources and assets to help the community and when they're going to have to ask um, for their own help and the resources and assets will flow the other way. Um, so planning and thinking about these things ahead of time, uh, I think really should be our, our concluding concluding sort of piece of wisdom here.